Good afternoon and good evening. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to our webinar entitled A Comprehensive New Guide for Nursing. My name is Jennifer Stiles. I'm the Senior Marketing Manager for Nursing here at Jones & Bartlett Learning and I'm joined by my um, esteemed author and DNP, Dr. Lisa Chisholm. So I want to welcome Dr. Chisholm to today's webinar. Thank you, Jen, and welcome everybody. Thank you, Lisa. Pardon me just one minute. We have just a few folks who are uh, just wanting to dial in and that just need that information. So we'll get that to them so that they have it. And we'll go ahead and get started. So we're very excited to talk about the third edition of Lisa's new title. And before we do so, I'm going to ask Lisa just to tell us a little bit about herself before we get started. OK, sure, Jen. Um, currently, I'm the clinical director of the Women's Wellness Clinic at the Carmanis Cancer Institute in Detroit, Michigan, and Farmington Hills, Michigan. Um, right now, we care for patients with new breast problems, benign breast problems, patients at risk for breast cancer, and breast cancer survivors. And through this practice, um, I noticed a need to help women who've been treated for breast cancer with their menopause symptoms that sometimes are induced by their treatment. So I became a certified menopause practitioner in 2010, and I recently completed a certificate as a sexual health counselor and educator from the University of Michigan. So now I've developed a menopause and sexual health clinic within the Women's Wellness Clinic that's been a really exciting um, adventure and been caring for women for these concerns, mostly women with a history of cancer. Um, I completed my DNP degree in 2007 at Oakland University in Rochester, Michigan. We had the pleasure of being the first DNP graduates in the state of Michigan. Um, I've been a registered nurse for, oh boy, 22 years, no, 25 years now. And I have been a nurse practitioner 21 years. So I've had an amazing career that just keeps getting better. Um, I've been involved in educating others about the DNP degree since graduation and uh, through the textbook and also through guest lecturing, speaking nationally about the DNP degree as well as about menopause and now sexual health. Great. Thanks, Lisa. That's certainly an impressive background. Um, so why don't we talk a little bit about why you created this text. And just for the audience and our instructors who are online tonight, if you have any questions, I do ask that you use the chat feature within WebEx, and we'll save those till the end. And we'll also open up the lines at the very end of the call, and we'll do some interactive Q&A. So Lisa, tell us a little bit about why you thought that there was a need in the market and created this textbook. Well, um, interestingly, I had just graduated from my DNT degree. I was out all of two months when I realized that a comprehensive guidebook was really needed to help explain the degree, as well as what to do with the degree once you earn it and how to integrate these newer skills into one's clinical practice. At that time, there was no research, resource like this available that summarized why, how, and what it meant to have a DNP degree. So I decided to take on the daunting challenge, and the first edition was published. I think the um, text has been a resource for those considering the DNP degree, as well as those who are in DNP programs. The history of how nursing has evolved to finally adopt a practice doctorate is fascinating, and I think it helps students understand why the time has come for a terminal practice doctorate. The um, text also helps explain to students and graduates how they can inter integrate the new skills they've earned and learned in a DNP degree into various advanced practice roles. For example, there are chapters on the DNP graduate developing roles in leadership, clinical practice, education, ethics. In the new edition, there's a chapter on the DNP graduate as a role information specialist. Um, and there's also a new appendix that shows examples of how I've integrated the DNP degree into my practice. Excellent. Thanks, Lisa. I understand that you have several new chapters in the book and that you cover some um, you know, specific topics. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about those two brand new topics as well as some of those specific other topics that are covered? Well. Um, the, the previous chapters are, are in the third edition as well. And in this um, edition, I, I've added chapter eight, um, which is the DNP graduate as information specialist. A colleague of mine actually authored this chapter. 
who's a DNP graduate, who really has become our information specialist guru. I actually work with her. Um, her she did a wonderful job reviewing the evolution, evolution of informatics in nursing, especially as an emerging field in nursing. She also review, reviews how and why the DNP can be a springboard into careers in information special, as an information specialist. She reviews specific roles that nursing informat in nursing informatics that the DNP graduate may develop. She also talks about additional certification as a nursing informatics specialist that can come after earning the DNP degree because one of the things that I noticed through earning a DNP degree is it frequently will open your eyes to unmet needs. Um, and I have found that as well in my menopause and sexual health specialty. So she does a good job reviewing how one can become certified in nursing informatics in addition to having a DNP degree and more fully specialize in these roles. And then the other chapter that's new um, was written by two colleagues of mine who actually are directors of DNP programs. And this was a topic I thought was really important to cover in this edition. We have many new students who are now embarking in the BSN to DNP degree path. And I think that this presents many opportunities but also challenges for DNP students, graduates, and for faculty. So my colleagues also did a really nice job even covering things like the economic challenges of the BSN to DNP path. Um, also the special considerations of the BSN to DNP students with regard to program, to program variability, such as programs online and as opposed to programs who are hybrid who may have in-person portions of their program. It's an important consideration, especially for students who are coming out of a BSN program, to perhaps be immer immersed with other colleagues. And maybe an online program may not be in their best interest because they may miss out due to their limited experience, previous experience, entering the, BSN, the, the DNP program after BSN. So they did a really good job reviewing that. Um, they also posed some additional options that may be favorable for folks in a BSN to DNP path, such as perhaps pursuing certification in the first portion of their degree, and therefore being able to practice as a certified advanced practice registered nurse and continue on for the doctorate. So I think they did a really good job. I think both chapters are timely. I think they both meet additional needs um, for DNP students and faculty. Great. Thanks so much, Lisa. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about your textbook in terms of how it stands up to the competition and how it's, um, how it's different and some of the advantages and takeaways that you want some of the nursing faculty to know about it. Well, um, I think it differs from the competition in that it was originally written and edited by a DNP graduate um, myself who had the unique perspective of a DNP graduate who really wasn't sure what this now meant for my career as an advanced practice nurse. So my text really is, is weaved in my personal experiences and my perspective of what it's like to graduate with this degree and really want to understand how it can further benefit your career as an advanced practice nurse. Um, it was written at a time when there were limited resources um, it's been updated over the past five years to include the timely issues such as marketing yourself as a DNP graduate, um, nursing um, ethics, and, and how um, ethics can be an emerging role for a DNP graduate as well. And then with this edition, the two new chapters um, are also very timely with, with um, topics that I think are emerging as new fields and new issues for DNP graduates. Thank now, you, as sir. far as, did you want me to talk about the takeaways as too, Jen? Yes, let's do okay. that. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think the three, the key points that I want readers to take away from this text is that it's practical, it's an accessible resource that shares information in a logical way that I hope is easy to understand. I have truly strived in each edition to make sure that the text is easy to understand and logical the way I would want to read a text. Um, on information that can be kind of overwhelming, especially for a new DNP student. So I think the takeaway really is that I, I'm hoping it continues to be a practical, um, accessible resource. 
I hope that readers can feel that they can relate to the scenario, the case scenarios and the interviews. I've updated many of the interviews and I've added numerous new interviews and some of the interviews are actually with DNP students who are in the trenches working and trying to get through their DNP program with ideas as to what they think the DNP degree is going to be able to do to enhance their career as advanced practice nurses. There's also some interviews from folks who are not DNP graduates but actual um, nurse executives working with DNPs to kind of give their perspective as well. It kind of gives a, a little bit of an insight into what DNP graduates may expect from their leadership when they do apply for positions or earn a degree, what the, how they can interact with their, their nurse executive leadership in what this degree means and maybe get a perspective as to how the nurse executives view this degree. So those are two new interviews as well. And finally, what I hope is that readers can view this text as a resource that they can refer to throughout their program, but also beyond their program and pick it up again after they're done if there's more things that they either want to explore, have clarification, or maybe just want reassurance as to how to develop their um, advanced practice roles further since earning their degree. I think that's a great explanation. Um, Lisa, and gives our instructors a lot to think about, you know, when they um, adopt your textbook. Oops, I skipped forward a slide. On this slide, I wanted to share some of the feedback that we've received. Unless, Lisa, do you have something you want to add? Um, I really, um, the feedback I get from folks are, are frequently students, and I'm fortunate that I've gotten really positive feedback from folks who do tell me that it's a logical, easy to read resource, um, has really helped them understand what the DNP degree is about and help them make their decision to go back to school for their DNP. Um, not being in academia, I'm not always exposed to faculty feedback, so um, it's reassuring to me to know that, that faculty can find this text useful. Yeah, so we hear that a lot of times, Lisa, that we have a lot of faculty who are teaching programs, who are new to teaching programs, and I just pulled together a few uh, quick quotes that I have and wanted to share them with other faculty today. Uh, the first instructor tells us um, that it was especially useful within the DNP residency and scholarly project development, that the text is well-written and uh, well-referenced. Another instructor tells us that this textbook has been uh, very well received by students because it's easy to apply and also easy to navigate. And, you know, we have also another instructor that tells us she's taught advanced practice roles for 12 years and that this book really best meets her course needs and really covers the content areas that she seeks to cover. Well, that's very reassuring. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is also a nice segue into some of the tips that you might have for students who are currently in the program. Um, yeah, sure, Jen. I, you know, I tell students when I get to meet and work with folks and either precept students or um, get to talk with students who are in DNP programs, it's really, really important to discover your passion. And whatever you're passionate about, take the skills that you are learning and the additional information and knowledge that you're gaining from a DNP program to build on that passion. Even folks who are coming from a BSN to DNP degree, you're going to figure out and develop your passion throughout your journey. And what's important is you build on that passion. Speaking of the DNP scholarly project, which the um, one faculty mentioned, the DNP scholarly project is a great way to begin scholarship. I had not begun my scholarship until my DNP project, and it really served as a springboard to build on something that I was very passionate about, and at that time, I'm still passionate about spiritual care, and I had the wonderful good fortune of um, doing a great project with my mentor, Dr. Morris Magnan, on spiritual care, and it really served as my springboard to scholarship, so I tell patients, don't get discouraged, and, not, excuse me, not patients, students, don't get discouraged and bogged down um, by the by the project is actually something that should excite you. You should be passionate about it. If you are passionate about it, it's going to make it easier to be married to it because it's going to be something that's going to take a lot of energy and a lot of time. So you want it to be something you care about. Um, again, it's your springboard to scholarship. It's really the beginning 
of how you start building that part of your career. And one of the best things that I found from returning to school for a DNP degree is it did introduce scholarship into my career. And I had not spent any time developing scholarship prior to that. Now I understand much with a much broader sense how important scholarship is. Um, also, I want to relate that when you do, I tell students, when you are in the program, sometimes doctoral study can be overwhelming. But give yourself time when you get out to assimilate into some of the new, maybe new roles or new aspects of your role that you can now develop. Um, I actually included in the text a new appendix that shares with folks how I integrated the eight essentials of doctoral education from the AACN into practice so that folks can see it really isn't that hard to begin developing these essentials within your career and you really are using these essentials. They are really are part of what you're doing on a regular basis. And hopefully, the appendix will help students see that. Um, I also included more personal anecdotes throughout this text um, and shared a lot more about my personal experiences so that students can understand how much this degree can really impact your career. I tell folks over and over again, sometimes you don't realize while you're in it just how much it's changing you and going to change how you view nursing, how you view nursing practice, your perspective will change and your lens will change. You will view the world differently from a much broader perspective. So I think some of the tips I want to share with faculty and with students is help students understand that while doctoral study can bog you down, it's OK if you don't exactly understand how the degree is going to impact you until you get done, because sometimes that's the unfolding that has to occur and you actualize into your degree, into your new roles, and the skills that you've developed to help build on your passion and help help your journey. I have found that although sometimes it's daunting, the degree can really transform you. Um, and it's definitely a journey that I have truly enjoyed. These are all really uh, wonderful tips, Lisa. Thanks so much for taking the time to share those. And I know that our instructors can pass those along to their students. So we're at the formal end of the, the presentation. And if you have any questions, we will be opening up the lines for live Q&A. Likewise, if you have any question that you want to ask via the chat, you can feel free to do so. You can um, just pull down the participant list within WebEx. You can right click on um, my name, Jennifer Stiles. I'm the host. And I can um, relay that question. If you want to receive a review copy, you can go ahead and request that by visiting go.jblearning.com slash dnp3. If you'd like to learn more about the DNP degree, Lisa recommends that you visit the fact sheet that's located on the AACN's website. And these URLs will be sent to you um, post-webinar as well. And lastly, Lisa does offer up her contact information if you have any questions and you'd like to reach out to her directly. So we'd like to thank her for doing that. So Lucy, at this time, I'm going to invite the operator on the line. And if you wouldn't mind instructing our participants if they have any questions, how they can do that. If you would like to participate in the interactive question and answer session, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. You will hear a tone acknowledging your request and a prompt to record your name. If no name is recorded, your line will be removed from the queue, and your question will not be taken. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Great. Thanks so much, Lucy. And again, if anyone has a question that they'd prefer not to ask over the phone, you may do so via the chat. And just to re reiterate, the third edition of the Doctor of Nursing Practice is available now. It just published recently, and we're super excited about it. And just to mention, um, Lisa's previous edition was the AJN, the American Journal of Nursing Book of the Year award winner. So we're really thrilled and happy that she received that honor, too. Lucy, any questions at this point? Yes. And your first question comes from Ms. Anderson. Great. Oh, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Gwen Anderson. And I'm just calling, uh, wanting to know whether or not you've had any commentary regarding the consistency of the DMP projects as a consequence of this particular textbook. Because that's been a major issue in the DMP education. Yeah, it, you're absolutely right. Um, 
I guess I don't really understand. You're, you're questioning whether or not the textbook has helped with answer yes. questions regarding the DNP project? Yes, I'm just wondering if you've received any uh, comments regarding the fact that the book is particularly helpful in providing consistency in the expectations for the DNP project. OK. Um, one chapter in particular does cover the DNP scholarly project. I believe it's still, well, I have it right in front of me, so let me double check so I don't tell you wrong. Chapter 4, Dr. Morris Magnan's chapter. He was actually my mentor. And I have consistently received comments that this chapter is helpful in discussing the DNP scholarly project. Um, mm -hmm. As far as specifics, what's, what's difficult right now is there is still much debate with what the DNP project looks like. And I do cover in the last chapter, um, the Looking to the Future chapter, that I believe there's more activity going on with the CIC, um, the Dean's Conference, and that they'll be reconvening in June. Here, I'm pulling it up right now. Um, a task force was convened in January um, and is reconvening in June of 2015 I believe via the AACN to further clarify the, um, the scholarly project because there is so much debate. Um, my, Dr. Magnan's chapter is excellent in that I believe he gives folks a lot of information and tips about the DNP project and advice about it. The consensus on folks really deciding what makes up a DNP project is still much debated in the literature. And so it's difficult to really give very straightforward advice as to what should be in the DNP project, because I think that's still in development. But the um, Dr. Magnan's chapter actually does do a really nice job addressing the project in a, in a general sense. Thank you for that response. Oh, you're welcome. And your next question comes from one of Marie Lenz. Hi, uh, this is Marie Lindsay, actually. Uh, so I'm assuming there are accompanying PowerPoints, as there have been in the previous editions. And are there any other either instructor or student resources? Well, the, the, student resor the instructor and student resources are still within the text, um, include the bulleted summary and the reflection questions. And Jen, can you answer to the PowerPoint? Yes, there are PowerPoints available. OK, so that's, that's basically the, those are the resources, the, the PowerPoints and whatever is in the book itself. Correct. Yes, that's correct. OK, thank you. You're welcome. You're and welcome. Again, that is star one to ask a question. And we have a question from uh, Linda. Uh, she's saying that there are questions regarding the practice emergent experience and the implication for the practice project. She'd like you um, to comment on that, Lisa. I'm, I'm sorry, what was that, Jen? Um, a question around the practice emergent experience, excuse me, practice emergent experience and the implication for the practice project. I think she's stating that there are, she knows or understands that there have been some questions around that, both the practice immersion experience okay. and the application yeah. for the practice project. I think she's speaking about nurse residencies, um, because many programs are, are requiring a certain number of hours of immersion. And that is threaded throughout specific DNP courses. I don't speak specific. I do mention nurse residencies um, in, I believe, the last chapter, reviewing where we're at with nurse residencies. And basically, it's program specific. Um, a certain amount of hours are required in most programs, I believe. Now, my program was so new that we didn't have an immersion experience. But many DNP programs are including an immersion within their courses, or they're calling it clinical hours. And it really is supposed to speak to the specific skills and roles, not so much roles, but skills within the DNP. So your clinical immersion is technically supposed to be in areas of health policy, leadership, and not necessarily clinical roles. Now, that would differ with a BSN to DNP path, because the specialty certification would take place most likely in the very beginning of the program. And those hours, those clinical hours, would be specific to your specialty as an advanced practice nurse. 
followed by immersion experiences or nurse residencies or hours that are spent in relationship to the specific skills within the DNP degree, such as skills in health policy, information technology, leadership. Um, I do cover those broadly, but because that type of um, curriculum is so program specific, it's hard to speak to what each program is doing for role immersion. And I do know that many programs then take this role immersion and do help develop the DNP scholarly project through perhaps what is done in the role immersion. Thanks, Lisa. Lucy, do we have any uh, questions that have come in via the phone line? I know we do have a bunch that have come in via, excuse me, via the chat panel. We have no further questions in queue at this time. OK. Uh, one of our instructors, Lisa, asks how you feel about using MDs as preceptors. And she goes on to say that most of her students are NPs, and they would like MDs as preceptors. And what are your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts on that are, you know, that's really speaking more to the advanced practice role. Um, I think that it is perfectly fine to have a mix of advanced practice nurses and physicians as clinical preceptors for the specialty portion, perhaps in the beginning, the, the first portion of the BSN to DNP path when you're, when you're doing a DNP degree post-BSN. I think it's helpful to have the perspective of two different disciplines, nursing and medicine. I think it can help um, an advanced practice nurse be more well-rounded and further develop their perspective in, on nursing as a discipline, because it is different than medicine. Now, when we're talking about clinical experiences related to the DNP degree, I'm not so sure there's really a role for an MD, because an MD is coming from a medical model and not a nursing model or a nursing um, discipline, where the doctor of nursing practice degree is really focusing on where we see nursing needed to develop, needing to develop additional skills, um, you know, through the Institute of Medicine's recommendations. So I think when we're talking about specialty advanced practice registered nurse preparation, it's perfectly fine to mix advanced practice nurses with MDs for clinical experiences. But if we're talking about the core curriculum of the Doctor of Nursing Practice, Information Technology, Health Policy, I think it's important to find folks who specialize in those areas. Now, they may not necessarily be DNP prepared, but perhaps they're a nurse executive in a high-level nursing leadership role. That would be a very valuable clinical immersion, especially for someone who's interested in pursuing leadership. And I think that answered her question for sure. Thank you. And do we have any more questions coming over the phone line? Not at this moment. OK. If you do have a question um, and you don't mind resending it via chat, I think that there were a couple of questions that might have um, gotten lost there. So Linda, thank you. I see your question. So let me pose that question right now. So Linda says, I am working with students in a DNP program who are working as APRN slash NPs in acute care physician practices where we are struggling to bring them into the DNP role. What are your thoughts about the credentials needed by preceptors in the field who are mentoring DNP students in DNP practicum hours? Well, again, I think that um, that speaks to what type of clinical immersion or practicum hours the DNP student is looking for. What kind of interests are they looking to develop, such as either policy or leadership. I think that um, if you're in an acute care setting, you can certainly find folks who are in leadership roles. You can find folks who are involved in information technology. I think what's, in, what's important is you find folks to mentor you and perhaps spend clinical hours with who are going to further develop the skills that you want to develop do whatever your interests are once you finish your degree or through your degree. So again, I don't think you have to be a DNP graduate to mentor students and to precept students in a DNP program. I think what's important is that that mentor or preceptor is bringing something to enhance the student's education in whatever area that student is pursuing. It is difficult to find preceptors in general for either advanced practice roles or folks in um, in, the, in a DNP program. So I think you do have to get creative and really 
in the end, focus on what is that student trying to develop? What additional skills as a DNC student are they trying to explore? What is it that they're passionate about when they want to finish their degree? And really hone in on that. I think that it's OK if folks aren't DNP prepared. OK, I'm not seeing any additional questions via chat. And I do uh, apologize if we did have some questions that maybe um, didn't get shown here. So if you do have any questions, just take a few more minutes and use uh, the chat feature. And you can message me directly, Jennifer Stiles, the host. But I will turn back to Lucy one more time. Do we have anybody else who's queued up um, over the phone line? Yes, one moment for your next question, please. Great, thank you. And your next question comes from the line of Vicki Morin. Yes, hello. My name is Vicki Martin. And the area that I work in, I will be graduating with my DMP May 1st from Chatham University. And the area that I work in, um, the physicians here are not very receptive to the DMPs. And we have really pretty much been um, almost ostracized because of the degree. We are looking in our college um, of setting up a DNP program. Do you have any pearls of wisdom to bridge the gap for um, other than team collaboration, just to educate them on what our roles are so that they would be more receptive to the DNPs? Thank you. Oh, wow, that's a great question. First of all, congratulations. Thank um, you. Welcome. Well, you know, I mean, I don't know how familiar you are with the text, but I certainly understand what you're going through. I dedicated a whole chapter, Chapter 11, to the doctor-nurse controversy um, using the title. But really, that kind of bridges over to talking about acceptance of the DNP degree by medical our medical professional colleagues. Um, advice I would have, um, personally, what I have found, I never have really push the title doctor with my colleagues. Um, the setting that I'm in right now, I started off just Lisa Chisholm. And as I slowly began to get to know folks, and I work in a very heavily academic research institution, um, an NCI certified cancer center that's surround, surrounded by folks who are MD, PhDs. So I very carefully tread lightly and try to be as non-threatening as possible and educated others about the degree. I've got a, a chapter dedicated to that, too, chapter 12, why didn't you just become a doctor? Um, because you really do have to tread lightly. And this is where you have to use your emotional intelligence and not threaten folks. The reason why I think our medical professionals are threatened by us is they think that we want to take their place, and we don't. They need to understand that we really want to work side by side. And this may even be more part of an APRN MD issue, which we face in Michigan as well, um, still not passing a very powerful bill that would help improve our practice. So it is not terribly uncommon what you're experiencing, and I do empathize with you. I've been fortunate to be in a couple different settings since getting my DNP where it was accepted. But I will say the setting I'm in right now, my colleagues are very respectful, but I was very careful to take the opportunity to educate them about the degree. I think you need to develop your elevator pitches so that you can speak very quickly as to what a DNP degree is. It is not a medical doctorate. It's a professional degree. But so is a medical doctorate, by the way. The only academic degree is truly the um, PhD. Um, the rest of us, you know, PharmD, MDs, folks with doctorates in, in physical therapy, we all hold professional degrees. And I think. It's difficult. It's hard. I want to give you all the advice in the world and all the empathy in the world, because it is a really difficult um, line to walk. You do want to encourage collaboration. You might want to offer in-servicing them um, on exactly what is the DNP degree. Um, you, I don't know how you feel about using the title doctor, but I've been careful with it, um, especially in my setting. And what's interesting is now they call me Dr. Chisholm when prior to 
first took about a couple years of me carefully educating them about the degree. I'm not that worried about whether or not they call me Dr. Chisholm. I don't introduce myself to patients as Dr. Chisholm. I call myself Lisa Chisholm. And if a patient calls me doctor, I'm just very clear that I'm a nurse practitioner, but they're more than welcome to call me that. I think that it's a power struggle that's not a new power struggle. Um, I think there is a lot of information in the text that can help you. There's at least three chapters that really kind of look at building relationships with others, building bridges, educating others, including our medical colleagues, and how to carefully tread these waters. Thank you very much. And by the way, we're using your second edition um, D&P book at this time in the program that I'm graduating from, and I absolutely love it. So I know the third edition will be only that much better. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. We have no further questions at this time. Okay, I do have a couple more questions that have come in over the chat, and we have one uh, instructor who's asking, can you talk a little bit about more how this textbook can meet the needs of the CNS to the DNP, if we haven't covered that already? Oh, the clinical nurse specialist to the DNP. Um, well, that is going to be, um, you know, that's going to be, the, the DNP degree is a generalist degree, and I talk a lot about that in the text, the fact that it's not a specialty degree. Um, so it's really for any, it was originally um, visioned for any of the four APRN roles, clinical nurse specialist, nurse midwife, nurse practitioner, and nurse anesthetist. I believe now as, as time goes on, it's also a generalist degree for nurse executives, folks looking at population health, public health, health policy. So it really is a generalist degree. So a lot of the examples in the case scenarios actually do include clinical nurse specialist roles. I was very careful to make sure that we included um, case scenarios that covered many of the advanced practice and even non-traditional advanced practice nursing roles. So really going from CNS to DNP theoretically is very similar to any APRN role to DNP. In fact, I think the CNS has such a unique role with, with regard to you have many different responsibilities, such as the responsibility to educate others that you work with. You actually may have some contact and in, in, in administrative responsibility. You have perhaps a research role as a CNS. So I really think the DNP richly prepares a clinical nurse specialist to go beyond and further enhance their career and their practice. So I, I think you'll find there are existing case scenarios that are re that really talk about the CNS role and use the CNS as an example. Um, also, in Chapter 1, um, I do talk about the National Association of Clinical Nurse Specialists and that they now also have um, DNP, um, um, not, not essentials, but um, core competencies, much like the um, NONPF. They also have core competencies. So that is included in Chapter 1 as well as how to go on the website for NACNS and access their core competencies. But they're also included in Chapter 1. Thanks, Lisa. And just a reminder, uh, if you do have a question that we didn't cover and we didn't get to it via the chat, I'll take a few more minutes and we'll take a few more questions. And not sure if we have any additional questions that have come in over the telephone line. And again, that is star one to ask a question. We have no questions in queue at this time. OK. Well, I think that concludes our presentation today. I really want to thank Lisa Chisholm for taking the time to talk about her experience as well as talk to you about what's new in the third edition. We're really, really excited that this textbook is, is out, and we've gotten some great feedback uh, from instructors already. So we do hope that all of you will take advantage and go ahead and request a review copy. You can do so at go.jblearning.com slash dnp3. If you'd also like to learn more about the DNP degree, if you have any additional questions other than what we've covered here today, I invite you to check out the fact sheet that Lisa has uh, referenced via the AACN website. And her email is also listed on the slide in case you want to follow up and ask her any additional questions. Do appreciate you taking time out of your evening with us tonight. And also, uh, thank you again to Lisa Chisholm. It was a real pleasure to have you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks so much.
Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. You may now disconnect. All presenters, please remain online.